perhaps just handing it over to you for like a brief kind of, can you show us the book? Uh, a little you. bit about it. It's called Everyone Wants to Work Here, Attract the Best Talent, Energize Your Team, and Be the Leader in Your Market. It is a, a pretty light read. It, it probably takes about, I had a series that was a one hour read. This is probably a little bit more than one hour, but maybe only about two hours to read in its entirety. I don't like to write um, big heavy books because I talk about managing your attention and, and <laughs> it's really hard to read a whole book these days for most people. So I try to keep them short. All right, um, so we can jump to what's in the book. And I think many on this call have heard about the great resignation and and quiet quitting. Uh, what do you think is really going on? Yeah, so I think that what makes people have a, a good day at work is at the end of the day, people can say, oh my gosh, that was such a good day. I got so much done. And in fact, that's not just my opinion. Research shows that as well, that uh, accomplishing meaningful things makes us feel satisfied and happy and productive at work and like we had a good day. And most work environments are set up so that we leave at the end of the day and say, oh my gosh, I was busy all day and somehow I got nothing done. Does anybody here have that experience where you go home at the end of the day feeling like you're exhausted and busy now? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> busy all day and somehow you got nothing done. And I believe that that is a culture problem. It's the it's it is partly our own behaviors, but in large part, our work culture is set up to prevent us from having good days at work where we um, where we are constantly distracted and there are um, there's a million things coming at us all day long and we just don't even have time to think but in fact thinking is what we are hired for and I think that that needs to change at the leadership level at the culture level but everyone in the organization contributes to the culture so the leadership has to help, but I think every person can work toward creating an environment for themselves where they can have more productive days. And that's essentially what the book is about. Great. In the book, you mention uh, unconscious calculations. Uh, what does that mean? Yes. Um, so unconscious calculations are things that we that guide our behavior that we haven't really examined. Things like, um, so one unconscious calculation is, well, I uh, people are bothering me all day long and I have to deal with that and that's part of my job. And so I guess I just have to get my work done when nobody's bothering me. Does anybody have ever have that feeling? I just have to get my work done when nobody's bothering me. And when nobody's bothering you is, when you're not supposed to be working, right? Evenings, early mornings, weekends, holidays, right? We all feel like, well, I can finally get caught up. But it's an unconscious calculation because I don't think anybody wakes up on Monday morning and says, oh, I can't wait to work every night this week <laughs> and all weekend too, right? And so my job is to help people get their work done at work instead of having to feel like they can't get their work done at work. And when we really shine a light on that belief, I think that it's very, um, it's ridiculous, right? I can't even get my work done. It is partly our fault because we think, well, being available to people is part of my job. Well, it's true. Being available to people is part of your job, but also all that stuff on your to-do list is also part of your job. And so why don't we put the same weight on that important work? Because when we do that important work that's on our to-do list, that's what makes us go home at the end of the day and say, oh my gosh, I got so much done. Instead of I was busy all day and I got nothing done. So finding that balance is really important. So that's one unconscious calculation. Another unconscious calculation is that I am providing good customer service if I respond fast. 
And we believe that fast is a metric of success, but I don't think that we ever really looked at that because we want to respond thoroughly. We want to respond accurately. We want to respond um, well. Anybody can be fast. Fast is not a differentiator. Fast is just fast. It might not be accurate. It might be sloppy. It's we feel like we have to respond immediately. So we leave our email and our chat open and downloading all day long so that we can provide good customer service. And I think that fast is not the metric that we want to be evaluated on. And when I ask leaders to think about, is that really the metric that you want your teams to be evaluated on? Fast usually doesn't make the cut when we really think about it. So those are, those are a couple of unconscious calculations. And if I can go back, Janice, to your question about quiet quitting, because I don't think I mentioned that. I wrote an article for Forbes called Why You Want Your Employees to Quiet Quit. Because I don't believe that quiet quitting is lazy employees trying to do the bare minimum. I think that quiet quitting is people finally saying, I have to do other things in my life besides work and I can't let work rule my life. Most people tell me that they are, uh, the first thing they do when they open their eyes in the morning is check their email. And the last thing they do before they close their eyes at night is check their email. And we are connected and therefore working all day long. And I believe that quiet quitting is really just people finally saying, I'm going to put some boundaries around this and I'm going to have some separation between my work life and my personal life. And the reason that leaders should want this is because that when we do other things besides work and when we take care of ourselves and when we um, we we reinvigorate our creativity and our motivation and our energy stores and we're actually much better when we come back to work than if we had worked the whole time. So I think that people have quiet quitting all wrong. I think it's kind of business propaganda. <laughs> ah, there we go. Um, from your side, is there a, like a single biggest uh, issue from your perspective that hampers uh, individual or organizational success, perhaps besides FAST? Well, I think that the biggest issue, and it's also the most underrated issue, is distraction. We are constantly distracted, but we are hired to think. We are hired for our unique combination of intelligence and experience and wisdom and critical thinking and problem solving, but also our humor, our kindness, our empathy, our our tact, our diplomacy, right? We are hired for this unique combination of skill sets that we have. And then we are put in a situation where research shows we switch what we're doing about every three minutes on average. But we can't muster the full range of our knowledge and our wisdom and our skills and our abilities in three minute increments. We are not our best selves in three minute increments. We are constantly distracted. And um, distraction, when we are switching what we are doing, every few minutes, everything we're doing takes longer and the quality is lower. So everybody tells me they wish they could get more hours in the day. The fastest way to get more hours in the day is to do one thing at a time. But our office environment is set up in a way that makes us feel like we can't even do one thing at a time. And so we constantly switch and then we end up leaving at the end of the day. Anybody have this with seven email windows open with emails half written, <laughs> right? I see laughing, right? And we have 27 browser tabs open with all of this stuff that we're half in the middle of. So we start a million things and we finish nothing. And so it feels completely unsatisfying at the end of our days. Distraction not only makes things take longer, it makes the quality be lower. And so mistakes cost money. They cost money to people, they cost money to companies. I think distraction is the biggest and most underrated problem facing busy professionals and organizations today. 
All right, very good. Uh, like I said in the beginning, if there's anybody else but me who uh, wants to ask about the book, uh, whether you've read it or not, uh, the topic here, uh, everybody wants to work here, I think is relevant to all of us. Uh, please just jump in. Uh, I did see Kate uh, indicating and then on indicating, just want to make sure. No, I'm good. good. Sorry, I was I was agreeing. I was like raising my hand in agreement. So. All right. <laughs> okay. I need to say good. my friend Chris Justice. Hi, Chris. Hello, everyone. Good morning. Good morning, Chris. Hey, thanks for connecting us. I'm happy this is possible. I was introduced to this book and the work of Maura by by you, Chris. So much appreciated. It's okay. It's um, Maura's work is the foundation of. Uh, Two companies that I've sold, um, and it's become the foundation of the Ooh. next. So, um, focus. I mean, I, I I took some classes and took some mentorship from Mara many years ago, um, mm -hmm. and then, unfortunately, I still have three monitors in front of me. But um, I bought the the audio book and the paper copy to make sure that we're constantly enforcing her ideas. Did you already have a chance? I know I'm putting you on the spot, Chris. Uh, did you already have a chance to look in the book? I'm curious. Of course. Okay. Yeah. So, um, you know, having followed her work for a long time, um, she has a, a philosophy and um, it all is kind of articulated in various steps of the book. And one of the reasons that I like this book and we're recommending and giving this to all of our employees um is that it kind of reinforces you can start the series of course in any way but i think this is essential reading for any company in any department if you're a manager uh if you are in a functional role you have to understand and respect um the the cumulative you know two decades of knowledge that is in here thanks Chris. thank you thanks chris uh much appreciated i'm gonna switch to switzerland from from Florida to Switzerland, Martin, you raised your hand. Yeah, so I think uh, in one of the chapters, you mentioning remote and hybrid working and the, the changes there. And so looking at my team, we have people here in Switzerland, but also in Germany and also different uh, regions of the world. Can you elaborate a little bit about the challenges there? Because yeah, different cultures, but also different time zones, yeah. Yeah, I think the key, well, there's two key commitments to when you have a remote or a hybrid workforce that I believe are kind of required to make it really work well. The first is asynchronous communication, meaning people need to be able to access the information that they need to do their jobs without having to ask someone else in real time. They need to be able to find it and easily and and access it so information needs to be very um, transparent and very organized and very accessible so that everybody has the information they need to do their job at any time and you don't have to have a ton of real-time meetings you can be very intentional with your synchronous communication. When you get the team together, there is a real purpose for it, not just so everybody can update everybody else on all their status, the status of all their projects and get all the information they need to keep their jobs moving. Everybody should have, anyone should be able to see the status of a project at any time and everyone should be able to access the information they need to do their job always. Without that, and the ability to to communicate asynchronously, it's very difficult to work with teams in multiple time zones because then you end up with people are taking calls at midnight and people are, you know, it's it's just it's real impossible. So that's the first thing. The second commitment that I believe is necessary for successful hybrid teams is a real rock solid commitment to work life balance. The kind of commitment that says, hey, and it, I noticed that I got an email from you at 2 a.m. in your time zone. What was that about? How can I help you? Right. I don't want you working at 2 a.m. in your time zone instead of 
thanks for your dedication, which is how a lot of companies would respond, right? It's 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 flipped. No, no, no. We want we don't want you working at 2 a.m. We want you sleeping at 2 a.m. so that when you get up at 8 a.m. your time, you can put in a full day of work and be energized about it. So without those two things, I think remote teams really struggle. Excellent. And then uh, and, uh, continuing on the unscripted path, uh, Thomas in Hamburg. Yeah, I was just wondering regarding what you just said, Maura, um, about uh, you have to make asynchronous work possible. Are there any, I, I always think there, that, that must be a new skill that people really have to learn, especially or, or, or in a basic or basic things like written. <laughs> Written work must be more important now. If I just leave a comment on a slide deck saying, I don't like this slide, nobody knows what to do next. So oh. <laughs> you must leave comment that makes the other people uh, or at least able to know what you what you thought and what you thought was the next step that you would take up. Uh, and it just, it, it just uh, doesn't fall from the sky, but people have to talk about that and learn how to work like that, don't you think? I I agree. I, I agree 100%. I also think that we rely a lot on written communication um, and we forget that there are other ways to communicate asynchronously. So my team and I will often make a voice recording and send it to each other or make a, a, a like a screen share with a voice and the, the screen like this is why I designed this page like this right and so I'm looking at somebody's screen and I'm hearing my webmaster say so this is what it looks like and she's explaining it all to me right and then I can leave comments on that video at certain spots in the video um, you could just get on on a teams or a zoom and hit record and say hey Thomas I, I reviewed that that slide deck that you made and you know here are some thoughts that I had right so it doesn't always have to be written and I think that people forget that and having actually that um, collection of recorded thoughts in addition to written thoughts can actually be really helpful because now you can create these libraries of how to's and all kinds of things and I think that we don't use that as much as we should. We don't have in this call I think a lot of people from startups it's mostly large complex global organizations and that's good they can help save the world too uh, but mm -hmm. i was curious to hear uh, your take Maura, on you know if we kind of look at the start of this like how do toxic always on organizational cultures get started you must have i think looked a lot of this and i'm um, curious to hear you know any advice and what can leaders do about it yeah i think that um i think that it's it's a it's a collection of, of many of the things that we've talked about so far. The the importance of speed and immediate response times and everybody expects an immediate response time. What is, do they really? I don't think they really do. What does immediate mean? I, I mean, I think most people are happy if they receive a, a response to their message within a few hours or a half day or within 24 hours, right? I think most people are pretty okay with that. Now, there are always emergencies that you need to shoot somebody a text or make a phone call or something. Hey, I just it really helped me to know this right now. A lot of times, though, when we need to know something right now, it's because we fail to plan appropriately. But, um, but sometimes, you know, time sensitive things happen. I get that. But for the most part, most communication, especially if information is transparent and accessible, most things can wait a few hours, one business day for a response. And so we say everybody wants everything now. And A, I think that's an unconscious calculation. I don't think it's necessarily true. And B, if, even if it is true, we don't we can reset those expectations so that it doesn't have to be that way. Um, so always on and fast response, so fast response times, I think, contributes to always on. I think this lack of a commitment to work-life balance contributes to always on. And I think this uh, lack of transparency and having information available, a commitment to asynchronous communication contributes to always on. And when people feel like they need to be always on, then they research shows that they aren't as good at their jobs. 
Great. All right. Any other comments, uh, questions? Um, I think so far so good. Um, I shouldn't say, like, you know, I shouldn't say they aren't as good at their jobs. I should say that they are. They can't apply themselves as well as they would be able to if they um, got more rest and disconnected from work more often. Yeah. Kate wrote in the chat uh, asking about your thoughts regarding projects that seem to require immediate attention. Um, I, I don't know, Kate, can you say more? So I, mean, I work I work at a university and we often have projects that come down from like the president or the chief of staff and the communications officer is always like, we need this now, we need this now. Like, and we as the peons down at the bottom of the ladder feel like we need to respond to that immediately. So essentially we have to drop everything else we're doing and focus on that project to get it to the higher ups as soon as possible. Just wondering yeah. if you had any thoughts about maybe how to deal with that or communication yeah. that we could use. I do. So, so to me, that's the result of two problems. One is that the boss is really bad at, at giving due dates. Mm -hmm. Most people don't say when they ask for something, they don't say, when do you want it by? Right. So, so the person asking should always offer a due date. I think it should be negotiable. Right. If you could get to this to me by the end of the day, that would be fabulous. There are some times when when they're when it's like I need it now. But most of the time you need a due date. When do you need this by? And. So people should offer that when they ask for something. If they don't offer that, the first question of the person who's asked to do the thing should be, by when do you need it? And I think people don't, we just assume, right? Unconscious calculation. Everything is right now. Nobody asks, when do you need it? And so that creates this false sense of urgency. That's the first problem. The second problem is that most people don't really have a great handle on their workload. Most people um, manage their work through some combination of their memory, sticky notes, legal pads, appointments with themselves in their calendar, um, flagged emails, right? Dry erase board in your office, perhaps. And when we manage our work that way, we don't really have a good handle on everything. And this is something that I address in the first three books um, in this in the series. It's called the Empowered Productivity Series about managing your work. If you really had a good handle on your work <clears throat> and you knew all the projects that were on your plate at any moment, then when your boss comes to you and says, I want you to do this thing right now, you could say, OK, happy to help. Did you know that I'm, I'm already working on these 12 things that you've asked for over the last couple of weeks? And if you could just help me prioritize this one with these others, that would be fabulous. And I'm happy to I'm happy to work on them in whatever order you decide is most important. But nobody has that language at their fingertips to say, yep, these are all the things I'm working on. Sure. How do I how do I incorporate that? So those are the two primary primary. Thank issues. you. Uh, we do have time for another one. I'm going to give it back to uh, Thomas uh, in front of a, an impressive bookshelf right there, Thomas. Just uh, just as a reaction to that, because I have made very good experience with that. Just like saying, oh, you want this now? Okay, no problem. Look at my list. Every boss I have met is happy to get that information and is quick in deprioritizing other things. And that's solved within a minute, and it's good. So it's, yes. it sounds <laughs> miraculous, but it works. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yes. The, the, book in, um, the book in the series that I would recommend, if that sounds like you, then maybe you might want to start with um, my little one-hour read book. It's called From To Do To Done. Um, it's hardcover. It comes in audio, though, in ebook format. Um, that will help you get a handle on your workload in a uh in a in a way that you can do what thomas does yeah i'll put that in the notes as well kate and everybody else uh we're coming up at the end um chris already recommended the book as well uh but i heard also maura that, that there was other people out there who 
who liked the book, uh, it made it to number one on on a list. No, it's not number one, but it did make the national bestseller list. Uh, the independent yeah. books are bestseller it's list. National bestseller list. That's pretty good. Thank you. And uh, Morton has jumped uh, a link in here on from to do to done. I'll add more. Um, yeah. Number six of your number six of your books. Um, thank you very much for sharing with us, Maura. Yes, happy to be here. Thank you so much for really? having me. Pleasure to meet you all. Really appreciate it. I think we covered some uh, some good ground here. Uh, I look forward to getting a hand on my book as well. I tried to order it from my local independent bookstore and it hasn't arrived yet, but I'm sure I'll get here soon so that I, similarly to Chris, uh, can flash my copy. Uh, I certainly agree with what was said here around distraction, but really interesting also to hear your take on the great resignation and unconscious calculations, uh, the need for speed, perhaps the false need for speed. Yeah. Any uh, closing comment from your side that you want to leave us with a specific favorite part of the book that people respond to say, hey, this is the goal here on page 56? Um, the the premise of the book is is really based on the premise of kind of all of my work, which is that the more relevant path to productivity in the 21st century, and I define productivity as achieving significant results. So the more relevant path in the 21st century to achieving your most significant results is to throw out the phrase time management and start considering attention management. Because how you manage your time only matters to the extent that you also devote your attention. If you had 26 hours in a day, but you still spent it switching what you were doing every couple of minutes, you wouldn't get any more done and it wouldn't get done any better. How you manage your attention is really, I believe, the key to success in the 21st century. And that's sort of the foundation of all of my work. And you can learn more and get all kinds of free resources at my website, maurathomas.com. Excellent. What a great closing. Thank you, all of you, for sharing your time and attention uh, with us on, on this. Uh, thank you, Chris, once again, for introducing me to Maura. Thank you, Maura, for getting up early. Uh, and joining us to uh, tell us more about the book. I really appreciate it. Happy to. Thank you all. Thank you, everybody. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you.